Hi, this is Jen Shea from Regents Hospital EMS, and I'm here with Dr. Aaron Burnett today for another episode of Ask the Medical Director. We have a couple great topics to talk about and a few questions to answer. So first off, we're going to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we get a lot of questions about this. Not too long ago, Regents Hospital took this on as an initiative that we can deliver, or we will deliver, equitable care to all patients, and we would like this to extend through to our pre-hospital providers. We also have a focus on high quality patient care and so we would like to be able to measure this through metrics. So Dr. Burnett, can you tell us why this is important for pre-hospital providers? Yeah, thanks Jen. So the National Association of EMS Physicians recently published a position paper entitled Essential Principles to Create an Equitable, Inclusive, and Diverse EMS Workforce and Work Environment. This was a paper that focused on recommendations uh, for DEI initiatives as it relates to EMS systems. It included increasing the knowledge and self-awareness of implicit and unconscious bias in EMS, uh, as well as acts of microaggression through established educational and training programs. It also recommended discussing cultural views that affect healthcare and medical treatment and the impact of social determinants of health on care access and outcomes. The third topic that was addressed in this position paper was a recommendation to design research and quality improvement initiatives related to health disparities in EMS that is focused on racial, ethnic, and gender inequalities. We strongly support these recommendations by NAMSP and want to support our services and their mission that focuses on this work. One piece our medical direction group is interested in looking at in our care delivery metrics are examining whether uh, we're delivering equitable care. Without measuring outcomes, it's difficult to say where we fall on the spectrum of care. There are multiple studies that demonstrate in other systems that inequalities in care do exist in the pre-hospital setting, including providing pain medication, as well as differences in pre-hospital care for conditions such as acute coronary syndrome, cardiac arrest, and stroke. At Regents EMS, we want to start looking at our quality metrics for care delivery and examine if there are any inequalities in care. We have a paucity of data that we look at every day, including time to EKG for cardiac chest pain, non-transport documentation, as well as cardiac arrest management. These can all be looked at through the lens of equitable care if race is consistently recorded in the pre-hospital patient care record. From a survey one year ago, only 50% of respondents with our services reported recording patient race in the patient care record. We would like to see this increase and plan to provide education to help providers understand the importance in the known data for inequitable care in other systems, as well as the significant morbidity and mortality consequences that this can have for patients. It's important to remember that EMS is a piece of the system of care for patients, and what happens in the pre-hospital setting certainly affects patients' overall care outcomes. This is exciting information, and I read a lot about this, and I am very curious to see where this, where this goes and where our research takes us. So speaking of data, with our first watch up and going, um, we have a few more providers who get that, that QA call. So if you, get, if you get flagged for peer review, help us understand what that looks like and that it's not such a scary thing after all. Yeah, we, we really don't want our peer review process to be punitive. It's not disciplinary. It's really truly designed to improve the patient care we deliver and to make sure that where there are opportunities for improvement, we're able to identify them and then change our practices to provide better care. I know going through the peer review process can be uncomfortable. I go through it on the hospital side as well. What I want people to take away from this is that a peer review process is an opportunity for us to make our care better. And what I can commit to you from the medical direction side is that we are taking peer review cases with the lens of an educational opportunity, not a disciplinary opportunity. So I'd ask you to approach a peer review uh, scenario with an open mind, a willingness to learn, and in understanding that there may be some constructive criticism that comes out of that. But everything is designed to improve your patient care. And as one of your medical directors, I can assure you that we at the physician team uh, will partner with you in the peer review process to make our care better, but to do it in a non-disciplinary, non-punitive manner. 
So related to that, I have also heard that you can avoid your opportunity to learn by when you have patients who have, for example, um, vitals outside of the normal range, not documenting them as normal, having a better explanation, or if there's some um, unique circumstances with the patient, doing a little bit better documentation to help explain why that, that scenario is different. Help me to understand how you could easily explain an abnormal vital sign. One of the areas we're focusing on right now in the documentation is ensuring that we are accurately reflecting an interpretation of vital signs. I have a saying that vital signs are vital for a reason and if they're abnormal they need to be explained or at least recognized. One of the trends we've seen in the documentation is that patients will comment or providers will comment in their narrative that vitals within normal limits. We'll also hear this on the MRCC reports as well. But there have been cases where that is not actually the fact, where vitals within normal limits has been documented or communicated and the patient presents with a significant tachycardia or tachypnea, an elevated respiratory rate. And so this is an area where we're trying to improve our documentation. Um, when you document about patients' vital signs, it's important to recognize if any of them are abnormal. Likewise, if patients are requesting a non-transport and you identify an abnormal vital sign, it's important you tell the patient about that because part of making an informed decision is knowing what you as a medical provider has, have uncovered during your assessment. So be careful when you're documenting around vital signs. If the vital signs are abnormal, don't document them as normal, and take one sentence to call out what you recognize as outside the realm of normal. Something as simple as saying, patient appears in no acute distress, heart rate what of 120 was noted, uh, that, that's the kind of thing we're looking for. And if that patient were requesting a non-transport, we'd like to see that you documented that you explained to the patient they had an abnormal heart rate and we did not have all the tools in the field to identify why that was abnormal, which is why we were recommending transport to the hospital. Once the patient understands that finding that you've uncovered with your vital signs, if they still choose to refuse transport, that is an informed decision. And an informed decision is the key to appropriate signing a patient off per their request. That's a good answer and that helped explain. Um, it also may help avoid a uh, peer review. Another thing that is a current topic we're hearing a lot about is NSTEMIs. Tell me, tell me what this is about and why all of a sudden this is, is so prominent in our care. Yeah, thanks Jen. So heart attacks uh, are called acute coronary syndromes in the medical term and there's basically three flavors of an acute coronary syndrome. There's unstable angina, which is where for temporary periods of time the heart muscle is not getting enough oxygen, but it's not a permanent blockage. This is typically your patient who has chest pain with exertion, but then sits down and begins feeling better. Once you have an occlusion of the coronary artery, that heart muscle starts to die. That's the key difference between unstable angina and a myocardial infarction. With unstable angina, the heart muscle isn't dying, it's just not getting enough blood causing angina. With a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, the heart muscle is actually dying. Now, we can detect this with EKGs. EKGs are really designed to identify STEMIs, ST elevation myocardial infarction. That is a very specific finding on the EKG that has a high probability of having a 100% occlusion of a coronary artery. Now there are also heart attacks which don't reflect STEMI on the EKG. These cases would be detected at the hospital with elevated cardiac biomarkers like troponin. When the heart muscle dies, troponin, which should only be found inside a heart cell, can be detected in the blood. If you detect troponin in the blood, you know that there's some heart cells that have died and they burst open, releasing the troponin into the blood. Typically, a normal blood troponin reading is zero. Now, patients who have chest pain angina and an elevated troponin but without a STEMI on EKG have a blocked coronary artery with dying heart muscle that we can detect with the troponin but their EKG won't show STEMI. This is what we would call a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now many of these cases still have EKG changes like ST depression or T wave inversions but they wouldn't have the classic STEMI findings. 
And there are a percentage of heart attacks that will actually have normal EKGs. So a normal EKG in the setting of a history that's very concerning for angina should not be completely uh, comforting. Those patients should still be transported to the hospital to have troponin levels checked, specifically to identify if they could be having a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And it brings about um, the need for paramedics to be critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our last question is about Todd's paralysis. On a number of the reviews that come back from education, we've had questions about Todd's paralysis. Tell me more. Yeah, so we love these questions. This is exactly the type of thing that we like to go over at these Ask a Medical Director trainings. So Todd's paralysis is a fascinating condition where after a patient has a seizure, they will present with paralysis on one side of their body, identical to that you would see with a stroke. The mechanism of Todd's paralysis is not completely understood, but you can imagine when the electrical activity in your brain is completely disorganized and results in a seizure, that it can take time for that brain to begin working normally again. We typically see this with the altered mental status of a postictal state. That's a, a good metric that the brain has not returned to normal after all the dysregulated electrical activity from the seizure. Todd's paralysis is a very specific condition where the brain is not returned to normal and it presents with weakness on one side of the body. This is so classic that when we look at patients who present to the emergency department who have stroke-like symptoms and we're trying to determine whether to give them clot-busting agents like TPA or tenecteplase, uh, altaplase would be another name, if that patient had a reported seizure prior to the onset of their stroke-like symptoms, we will not give those thrombolytic therapies that are designed to dissolve blood clots because they have risks of bleeding in other parts of your bodies. And if there was a seizure that occurred immediately before the patient developed weakness on one side of their body, we would presume the diagnosis is Todd's paralysis and that there is not a blood clot causing a stroke. So it's very important to recognize when patients have had seizures immediately before their paralysis. That will absolutely affect the treatment options that are available to them in the hospital. And your history for, as EMS providers is critical in relaying this information to us so that we get the right care for the patient. What a fascinating concept. Well, that wraps up this edition of Ask the Medical Director. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.